a lot of people in this room and I'm kind of nervous, so definitely go easy on me. Uh, unlike the, the great Jim Silva, this happens to be the first time I've given a, a keynote. And unfortunately, the topic is uh, failure. So, <laughs> really interesting to, to see how it goes. I think step one is getting this clicker to work. And then step two is talking to you about failure. So let's see if we can get this up and running. Yep. There it is. There we go. There we go. <laughs> So there's going to be probably a few other instances where something doesn't go right, but that's the exciting thing about this session. Um, in fact, I have a whole resume of failure that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, and the reason why I want to talk about failure is because I think it's important to take risks, reimagine, and put yourself out there. And so hopefully throughout this next 45 minutes to an hour, I'll talk about a few examples of failure in my life. I've put myself out there and failed. I've tried to reimagine things and failed and I've taken big risks and failed in really big ways. <laughs> so the first one is I, uh, I flew yes. to this place called Johannesburg to talk with some teachers. And I was faced with a question, because I got jet lag, and I don't travel international very often. And so I wanted to like catch up on my sleep, right? And so there's these pills, I don't know if you guys have them here, called NyQuil. And so I was faced with a decision. This is your last chance. <laughs> After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I am be sitting in my hotel, thinking about this, <laughs> um, trying to figure out, like, should I, should I take the pill? I end up taking it, right? Um, about 5:52 a.m. yesterday rolls around. My teammates start to wake up and do things and get ready, and uh, Molly's like, James, are you ready? Uh, I'm having my like, cute little Google dreams, and I didn't have a care in the world. And I failed in a big way, and this happens to be the first time I went international to do a summit. And, uh, Jim's still reminding me that it might be the last time I get to do it. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Jim Silver. <laughs> no, we're definitely not talking about him, though we will make a cameo a little bit later in the session. I wanted to talk about my story, and actually I wanted to go all the way back. This is the map of the world. I live over there. Let's zoom in a little bit. Zoom in, please. Can you zoom in some more? Oh, right there? Yeah, that's where I grew up. Wow. Right in the middle of the sticks. Woods everywhere. In fact, this is like a compound out in the woods. And if you look closely, we have a, the plumbing truck, the garage. This is the chicken coop. Since we're not in the United States, I can tell you. But back here, my dad has a still where he makes his own whiskey. Um, and then there's the house. No joke. But if in the United States, don't tell anybody because it's illegal. Um, and I went to this amazing high school, and I say amazing in a most ironic way because it's actually a terrible school. And I went to the principal's office a lot, and I learned a lot. Not about academic stuff. I learned one question that I keep coming back to my entire life, and that question is why. I've always been asking the question, why? Why does this have to be this way? How can I reimagine it? How can I take risks to change it? What can I do? And in fact, I realized that things weren't right because I grew up in a town of all white people and our high school mascot was the Redskins, which is a derogatory term against Native Americans. So I'm like, things aren't right. So if we break down what I've learned during those four years, I learned about 5% of math, 15% of science, 16% of language and history, and the rest was just a lack of adherence. <laughs> I did not want to comply. In fact, I had this dream that I was just going to be a professional golfer and do whatever the heck I wanted. But I realized quickly that I'm not going to make any money doing that because I'm not that great of a golfer. And so I went to work in the paper mills. I don't know if you've ever been into a factory before. But you put on a hard hat, you know, you put on your old overalls or whatever, your wrenches and stuff, 
and you go to work. And so for three summers during college, I went to work here. This is the actual paper mill that I worked in. And over those three summers, here are the, here's the data. I earned two specialized vehicle permits so I can drive a Bobcat and a forklift, so the EdTech team also provides some of those services. <laughs> and I took three trips to the hospital. One, a sledgehammer fell and hit me on the head, left there was wearing my hard hat. Two, I got some caustic stuff stuck in my eye, so I was bleeding some tears. And three, I broke my left wrist. I learned that that wasn't going to work for me. Those mistakes proved to me that the mill wasn't where I should belong. And so if you look at the course of from that mill across my entire career, I have a whole bunch of mistakes. And I want to focus in on a few of them and then show you how those big failures have led me to where I am today and the mission that I'm trying to fight for. So the first one was I tried to start a t-shirt company called Flame Age. The only problem is I couldn't draw. <laughs> But I knew how to go online and order shirts, so it quickly failed. The second one, I was in the university, and I wanted to figure out how could we redesign the system, the general education requirements, but nobody would listen to me. And then I tried to teach, and as you can see here, the kids are sitting in rows. Mistake number one, it looks like they're engaged, but instead it was more like this, where they're throwing stuff at me. It was a complete failure. And it wasn't until I started teaching with technology that things started to click for me. But I wanted to make money still, so I tried to start an online poker website <laughs> called Ribbit. I can talk to you about it. It's a great freaking idea, and I haven't given up on it yet. Except for the name Ribbit is really expensive. The domain, if you look at it, i got a laser here. I said, hey man, you own this domain, can I buy it? He said, it's 4,800 US dollars. I said, okay, I'm gonna do something different. <laughs> so I'm gonna go out and take some more risks. And the next one that I took, oh wait, I wanna tell you this part. Um, there's this idea called the butterfly effect, right? And that's where one little thing happens somewhere. And the impact of that may change the shape of the world. And this was an idea that I bought into early on. And I thought about this other concept of making your own luck. And so since then, I've always kind of said, why am I here today? And it's those three things, taking risks, reimagining stuff. But I also think a lot of the stuff that we're about to talk about comes from being lucky. And working really hard to put myself in a position to get lucky. And so all the next stories that we're going to share is not because I'm special in any way. I've just gotten lucky. And I can think of actual people that would do all of these things a little bit better than me. But I was the one who got lucky. So the first ones are things that happen in the classroom. And this is the first instance where I got really lucky. Kip Academy is LAUC Charter that was founded in 2003. It goes from 5th to 8th grade, and 350 students have been this year. We walk into the social studies class, we grab a computer, we go to Mr. Sanders' blog that he created the day before, and we follow the task or steps that are set. My class is entirely run online, and so my course is shifted from more of a direct instruction model, and then the students do some type of graphic organizer, some type of assignment, to a more interactive based model where the students are actually required to think independently, create, collaborate, rather than just memorize and regurgitate. I think it's definitely a better model for learning. For you to have that one-on-one -on -one connection with your teacher rather than sitting in class and raising your hand all day and never get called on, I think that's just better. All my assignments in Google Docs are all stored and it's not all unorganized and I can easily send it back to It gives us open access to different applications and programs such as Google Moderator where we can vote on different ideas that our teammates give us. There are different ways you can make presentations using the actual presentation mode on the documents in your Gmail. I think our grades are going to go up using this. The Google Chrome notebooks, I think they're very unique. They create the next generation of computers. So this was before they were called Chromebooks, and for some reason our, our school got chosen as one of the few schools around the world to get these prototype Chromebooks. And it completely changed my life. 
And so I looked at this moment and said, how can I push it further and do more because of the luck that I had to get these Chromebooks? And so I started putting lessons online and doing everything through the cloud and using tools like Google Moderator, having students go in and have discussions. And I was teaching in South Central Los Angeles, which is probably one of the more underserved communities in the United States. You've probably seen it in the movies. And we started to have discussions around European conquest and the takeover and slavery and issues like that. Where most of the time, if you're talking about these topics in middle school, it's a very surface level discussion. But because the students were all online, it forced all of them to have an opinion. It forced all of them to participate, not just the five you know, know-it-alls who would raise their hand in front and share. So this is an interesting example where I asked the question, was the European conquest or takeover of America ethical? And the students gave me some interesting data. So very few said yes, those are the ones that probably weren't paying attention when I was trying to teach them about this stuff. <laughs> but something interesting happened where the other class were divided around the idea of no, or no, but it was a necessary evil to get to the society that we have today in America. And so then I asked them the question, why do you think 45% of your teammates believe slavery was a necessary evil? And if you think about the level of depth that a conversation a 12-year-old is having in South Central Los Angeles with a white teacher and all black students, it's pretty intense and pretty amazing. And that's all because of the internet and the web and students being able to collaborate online. And it totally blew my mind and set my life off into a different course saying, we need to get these tools out to everybody else. We need to make sure that Google's doing a better job of creating these tools. How can we push it? And so we started traveling around, took my students to Washington, D.C. I had all sorts of fun things, but I wanted to do more. I wanted to get out and talk to more people. And so we connected with a class in Prague. I met a teacher at the Google Teacher Academy named Patrick Green, who knew a teacher at his school who also taught the same subject. And so we came together and we created groups. And so one of my classes, half of my students happened to live in Prague. And for the teacher over there, Mr. Hayes, half of his students happened to be in my classroom. And I would teach them, and then they would collaborate online, all asynchronously because the time zones were very different. They had access to an amazing castle with all these artifacts. We had access to the internet, and we worked together. And we, and this, I don't, never actually read this article, because it's in some language that I don't know. But this is us right here, Camp San Francisco Bay Academy. So. Um, and each student was given an artifact. We didn't tell them what it was. In fact, most of the people didn't know what it was because it was coming from this castle where they had just gotten all their artifacts back from Germany because they were confiscated by the Nazis. So this museum was trying to put together the story of what these are. So we gave each student, or each pair of students, an artifact and said, tell the story. And so they had to go figure out what the heck it was, figure out what type of paint it was, where it was made, and what was it for, and tell that story. And then they put their artifacts in the museum with the story next to it. But it wasn't all easy and fun and games and things like that. There was lots of problems. And when you have students with computers, we're going to talk about some of the problems that come with that. You know, one of them is breakage. So even on the very first day, I had to come up with a video to say, crap, don't break the computers anymore. In fact, I'm going to show well, you how to hold the classroom them. James here said we're going to be talking about moving around the classroom with Chromebooks, like physically holding the Chromebooks, and how you should move around the room with them, and not. So why do teachers care so much about how you hold a computer? I mean, it's a computer. You carry it, and then you move around the classroom. We get it. First of all, you'd be surprised what your fellow classmates get and don't get. And even if your school is a secret power with billions of dollars in gold, though it is more than likely that their money for technology comes out of something closer to this. Regardless, they've invested thousands of dollars to provide you with these powerful instructional tools. So please listen carefully. <laughs> Our friend Mauricio is going to show us how to carry a Chromebook. Here he's carrying a Chromebook like a dog begging for a treat. <laughs> And the way he's carrying the hero more likely to get into the principal's office rather than his desk. In his third attempt, he's opened his chrome before he's arrived at his work table. If he was trying to impress me by showing me how excited it was to work in my class, it didn't work. <laughs> Thankfully, it looks like the fourth time was a charm, because here, Mauricio firmly has two hands underneath the Chromebook with his thumbs on top and ready to move about the classroom. Nice work, Mauricio. <laughs> so these are road bumps that we had to overcome in teaching the students how to carry the Chromebook, now save money so that we can have these computers from year to year. So it wasn't always great, but we did do another project that was really exciting, and this came through failure, but it learned something completely amazing. So I went around and begged my families and friends and parents for a small plot of cash, and we went on to Kiva.org. Kiva.org is an amazing website where you can actually make small loans to people around the world or entrepreneurs who are trying to get money to fund their business. And so we use this to teach history, where all the students would go on to Kiva, 
and look at the different proposals and decide where we were going to loan our classroom money. And we would make one loan a month in the amount of 25 US dollars, and we would do a voting project to figure out how we wanted to lend our money. We kept track of it all in a Google spreadsheet. Sometimes we would lend a little bit more as we got more money, and then we'd have different proposals on what we were trying to do, and the students would have to keep track of the repayment terms and the average pace at which these entrepreneurs would pay us back. And if you're able to go from just learning in a textbook about geography, and here's how people in Africa live, to understanding what entrepreneurs on the ground are trying to do and how much our money can impact and change the world over there, we've completely reinvented the subject, completely reinvented the classroom. So I'm gonna ask you, how do you set your students up to put themselves out there? And, and take risks. And one of the ones that we did was this project called KIPP Student News. Rather than doing that like today is current event Friday, put in your assignment, put it on a paper and turn it in, why not reinvent that and have your students do a production where they put out their stories to the world. We had a news show called KIPP Student News. You can go and watch any of the episodes on YouTube if you do a search for KIPP Student News. But here's a little taste of it. Recently, President Obama has gotten some complaints from going to a hot dog restaurant and eating two big chili dogs with an extra bowl of chili on the same day that First Lady Michelle was announcing the new guidelines for a good meal. <laughs> it shouldn't be that big of a deal that the President had a chili dog. We probably should have done it on a different day. He probably got into a little trouble at home this week. That was the member of Congress over in Washington, D.C. Congressman Michelle is the representing Los Angeles in Washington, D.C for the past 18 years. Now here's DJ. Hi, I'm Diamond Joseph here at Kip Student News, here to ask Congressman Messer a few questions. And how does your job in force you to manage your impulse in any way? Well, remember that we vote for, for everything from whether we should this, this war, complete crap, right? <laughs> don't believe a word they ever say, especially American Congressmen. I obviously have opinions. I want to try to do the best I can. <laughs> but we also had some fun failures when we were making these videos and putting ourselves out there. So I decided to take my students on a boat cruise. And there was you know, a group of 30 of us, and the school had said, OK, we trust you, Mr. Sanders. Take these kids over to Washington, D.C. You know, you guys have a lot of fun, and they had the power of YouTube, and we had fun, and all of a sudden this video ended up on YouTube from our dinner cruise. Oh, uh, my friend. It is now time. Good to meet you tonight. Let's go to the Kip Student News Hall of Fame. 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 So I quickly asked Courtney to switch that video to unlisted to share it with your friends rather than it being public. But that brought about this idea of what if all the students publish their work online, not just those crazy dance movements. We know that your students have an online identity already. It's probably just made up of what they ate and drank that day, you know, how often they went to the bathroom, and what they took a selfie of in that bathroom after watching gym session. So what if, though, they all had a website? Okay, let's try this out. So they gave them all a blog, and they started publishing all their work to the website rather than turning it in. And something interesting happened, where not very many people must be doing this because my students quickly shot up to number one in Google searches if you did a search for any of their first names and history portfolio after it. And to this day, if you do a search for Chris history portfolio, it will be the number one Google result. This is a seventh grader, 12 years old, living in Los Angeles, and his work is stuff that's popping up if you're doing a search for Renaissance art or portfolios and stuff like that. And it's crazy. We teach them about the power of having your stuff there. And then some positive things happened after that. We started getting recognized for, for our work. 
But we're not done there because there's a lot more failure to come. So even though I don't work at a school still, by having my students online, when I put them online a few years ago, um, they're still my students. And my clicker might have stopped working. I'll use the mouse button. I have never left the classroom. In fact, I have conversations with my students all the time, but my new classroom is Facebook. My new classroom is Google Chat. Here, a student was reaching out to me saying, hey, I was looking for this resource, and they said, hey, I'm in South Africa, that's awesome, where's the resource? And I sent them the link. And it's pretty crazy that I'm able to still feel like a teacher because I'm still with my students, it just happens to be those same students that I was teaching years ago. And so I'm saying, your classroom is what you make it, and right now, you know, I feel like I get to talk to you about stuff, and hopefully you'll take some of these ideas and go out there and follow along, and I hope it's not the end. But then, something really bad happened, again. <laughs> so I'm not going to share the title of this video, and I'm not going to share the student who made it, but I have a Google Apps account in my name, in our school's name, and they decided to publish a very inappropriate video. So yes, your students should be online, but make sure they understand about safely posting online. But, and I'll say his first name, because we're going to meet him here in a second. Ricardo didn't care about that. They probably had gone to a gym still session and said, like, putting yourself online is a good thing. You want to get a million YouTube views? Well, he got 1.8 million YouTube views for something crazy inappropriate. And his account name had his first name, his school name, and the city name. And I only found out about it when he wanted to figure out, said, hey, I have this video online. I should be getting some money for it, right? 1.8 million people have watched it. And I'm like, holy m <laughs> <laughs> And here were the data. So him and I looked in and dug into the data. And I said, oh, Ricardo, because it was on your education account, you actually didn't make any money. I'm sorry. But yes, 1.8 million people found it. So it was a lesson for him. And so he's then gone to try to reinvent himself. And he wants to become a rapper. This is Little Wero. If you should look him up, these aren't real tattoos. These are probably Sharpie markers. He's 14 years old. But I'm here to sh share with the students in the back that you should look him up because he's pretty good. We're here a little sample. This is the only clean stuff I could find. <laughs> I'm gonna live my dream working on reality. Yeah, you see, I'm the youngest because I'm only 14. Man, I love my city. Beautiful women. Cutting with a cold word. And I'm still ready. And that's all we could find in the beautiful women. <laughs> but check this out. We taught him how to add interactivity to his videos. So if you click on some of these, it might go to a different video of his. Or if you click the top one, you can subscribe to his stuff. So he's figuring out how to put himself out there. So ask yourself how you're going to put yourself out there. And here comes the next example of a gigantic failure. Um, so, so Jim and I, like Joe and I, decided that we wanted to make a podcast, and that's how we became friends. And I tweet a lot. I used to tweet a lot. And I, I don't tweet too much anymore, and you'll figure out why. Um, and I posted this tweet, and I like this idea of you know people standing up for themselves. And I'm like, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword. And when you tweet, you want to have a hashtag. So a really eloquent tweet. And I want to do a hashtag, and so you know, I put it out there. And I didn't know this, but if you <laughs> make a hashtag. Oh. So, <laughs> so, so Jim shared, like, hey dude, look what you just posted. <laughs> and um, he got me, saved me. And so then the next day, we're doing this chat, uh, this Education Cast podcast, look it up, they're pretty entertaining. Here I am down below, so you can't really see my face, so I wanted to get him back a little bit. So we always have a back channel going where we're trying to make jokes and whatnot. And so I want you to look and watch Jim's face and look for the moment that he receives that same hashtag joke back to him right in the middle of the podcast. Trend. Well, the student strand uh, was won by uh, by this video called The Author. <laughs> and so it's this, uh, it's this group of elementary students uh, talking about 
you know, we're really good. You know, what's important? What, what is the author trying to do? And they, they clearly had a tremendous amount of fun putting it together. Uh, the kids really did. That show, which, which is always a good thing. And then also, uh, they have this, this kind of thing of like, okay, well, you know, they, they really put a lot of work in there. Is this something hanging out of my nose? <laughs> So Rushton really, you know, he was here last year, bless his heart, couldn't, couldn't really handle it. Um, so we, a few episodes after that, got out of the podcasting game. Um, but, I, but I learned a lot, and through that we were sharing our ideas out there to the world, and the, the world happened to be the five people that listened to the education cast. So I'm like, let's take our ideas and go straight to the source. I'm going to go and tell Google what they should do. Right? Here's the grand idea. Oh, it blinks. Hold on. All right. I think I got it. Google. You could lose a job. Google. Not a job. Job. It's an interview for an internship that could lead to a job. Uh, Nick, this might be the last chance that we got. So, so I drove up to Google and sat down with probably what is the core brain trust of the Google education team. This is like Jamie Kassup and people like Dana and Nina who are no longer there. You know, I had who's who in the room, and they were about to listen to me, so I was really excited. I spent two nights up before preparing this deck, and I went in there and said, my vision for the future of Google products in the classroom. This has happened in August 13, 2011, right? Sorry, the date is backward. And I told them that, you know, you need to do something for teachers specifically, because we're not getting enough from you right now. And I asked him, what can you do? So I said, you should create a product called Google Teacher, and this is what it should look like. Complete crap, right? If we got something like that, it's like, what are we thinking? And I said, you should create a tool called Google Classroom, and this is what it should look like, and this is what it should do. And I said, you should create a project called Student Portfolio, separate from Blogger. Obviously, they didn't take any of the ideas, and I guarantee that the team that worked on the actual Google Classroom never saw this or heard about it. And so I said, rather than telling people what to do, what can I actually go out and do? and reimagine the world that we have. And so this butterfly showed up and I got pretty lucky and Google invited me to join the team as a contractor and I got to build this website called YouTube for Teachers and they paid me for two years to watch YouTube videos and find the ones that were good for teachers and put it out there. And so even though they didn't take my ideas, but I took that risk and set up an opportunity to get lucky. There's a lot better teachers out there that should be curating the videos, but I happen to be the one that got lucky. And they started writing about our stories, saying these teachers are now coming up and starting things. And because I happened to be at Google a lot of times, I met Sergey Brin's mom. And we became friends. And we decided to do a company together. And any time you're doing a company, I guarantee having Sergey Brin involved makes it a lot better. <laughs> and so our company got bought. And it's like, that's awesome. But let's go back to some of the failures that we're having. So, even though that happened, Class Badges was purchased, it's complete crap. I, to this day, don't know why teachers use it. There's a better product that came along afterwards, thank God, called Predly. And we were almost purchased by them, and I am so thankful that somebody else came along and built a better product, but I learned a lot about myself. So even though I would say that it was a success in name only, and only because Sergey Brin was involved, um, but it was a complete failure. But because of all of those failures leading up to this moment, I don't know how we're doing on time. Perfect. Um, the White House came calling and said, hey, you know, we have this program called the Presidential Innovation Fellows, and we want you to join. And I joined. We've also welcomed a new class of Presidential Innovation Fellows, and I love it. Uh, for uh, the press to meet some of these folks because they're extraordinary. These are Americans with vast private sector techno uh, technology expertise who have volunteered to come serve the country <laughs> in the private sector. And Forty other fellows are taking this private sector expertise and bringing it into the government, making it smarter, making it more user-friendly. So, 
One of the things that this moment in my life taught me was that the NSA isn't very good. Because if they could go back in time and look at all the things that I've done in my life before that, I definitely would not be allowed to walk into the White House. And I even asked some of my, my friends here about another story that I wanted to tell, and they said, mm, probably not. Uh, but I got in the building, I was in the door, I'm standing in the West Wing, and I'm figuring out, okay, I'm here, now what the heck can I do? to get the word out. And here's a little trick about Washington. I don't know how if it works the same um, with your country, but they like to schedule events, <laughs> schedule who's going to be there, and then later figure out what the heck we're going to talk about. <laughs> it's this big circus around, okay, we have an event next week, we have no idea what the president's going to say. Let's come up with some new policies that we should put out there. If you tweet that, I'm coming after you. <laughs> and so I said, why don't we do a film festival? And why don't we invite students from around the country to submit videos describing how they use technology in the classroom. And the problem that I was trying to solve here is we have this debate worldwide that should teachers be teaching or should technology be teaching. And my argument is that if you take a great teacher and give them great technology and empower them with the skills to use it, that's when you have the magic. And so we had the event. This happened, which is completely awesome. <laughs> and we got a lot of amazing videos, and here's one of them. At High Tech High, our number one focus is that students make a difference in the world. And our guiding philosophy is that technology helps students make a difference in the world. Take a current project my classmates and I are working on, for example. Beyond the Crossfire is basically a social justice research project where we are seeking to answer two questions. The end product of Beyond the Crossfire will be a documentary in which we will present our ideas on how to reduce the amount of gun violence in the United States. Now, so we got this and 3,000 other videos similar to this, and now what's happening is people do events around the country and they're showing these videos, and now students have a voice where they're talking about their learning and they're saying, hey, you need to fix the internet, you need to fix this stuff because we're too important to not have it. Um, so you're probably saying, yeah, these are great slides, but like, why does this crap matter to me or stuff? Uh, my argument to you is, there's some giant problems in the world right now, and we've proven that we can't solve them in a very real way. So our climate's getting warmer. 25% of all prisoners live in the United States, so we're really bad at that. And pretty soon we're going to need to figure out how to go somewhere else. But our brains aren't capable of solving those problems. I believe our students' brains are, though. And it's our jobs as teachers to teach them how to learn, teach them how to be entrepreneurs, teach them how to go out and fail on their own, and then they can try to solve some of these problems. And so I'm arguing to you that your savior isn't going to be arriving anytime soon. It's totally up to you. And so there's no magic tool, there's no magic wand that we're going to sprinkle or serum the students are going to take and come over you, and there's no game that's going to put a student and teach them all the things that they need to know. It's going to be you that do it, and I think big problems require big solutions. And so why? There's a bunch of questions that we need to ask, and we're running quick, low on time, so I'm going to skip through a few of these to get to the other part. Back. Um, because I think sometimes you have to be able to put yourself out there and take gigantic risks. Um, and it's one of the ones that really strikes me is 25 years ago, this happened. So I'm going to say that whether you're standing in front of a tank or standing in front of a classroom, you're taking a risk. And just think about how big of a risk you're, you're willing to take. The way that you can do this is by starting small. And this author, Austin Kleon, does a great job of modeling this for us. And that is if you leave today and take one small risk, 
or do one small thing. And then you put that together with one week and you have this body of work. And you do it for one month and you have this body of work. And I didn't do the math, so this is probably plus or minus a year. <laughs> it adds up. So I've taken to this philosophy and for the last four years been trying to put myself out there every single day in some small way so that it adds up into some big body of work so that we can have real change. So you should be doing this, your students should be doing this, and our world is craving for something like this. There's a new app that we have in the States, I don't know if you have it here yet, called Secretly, and people are craving to share. People are craving to get their stories out there. And on, on Secretly, you can share something that's a secret that you don't want anybody to know, and it takes away all of your personal identity stuff, but your friends and your friends of friends can read your secrets. So here's one. <laughs> but then here's another one. And they're putting themselves out there. And try to figure out how can you do something similar in your classroom where you design spaces where students can be safe and students can fail. And how are they going to be creating their own luck starting today? Well, this summer. And my clicker stopped again. So let me go back because it gets really good. <laughs> What risks are they going to be taking? And how are you going to reimagine what you're doing? So I wanted to tell you in closing about the next big risk that I'm taking. Um, all of the stuff that you saw before, I tried to hedge my bets by having stuff overlap, right? So if one thing failed, like the education cast, I still had these other two things to kind of fall back on. And I found that I wasn't very good at any of those things. I was mediocre at a lot of things. And so now what I'm doing is clearing the decks of all of the side projects, everything else that I'm working on, no more this, no more that, and say so I'm going to work on this one project called Future Ready Schools. And what Future Ready Schools is, trying to create a global movement around fixing or modernizing our schools. Because I think the current system that we have with people sitting in lecture halls in their rows listening to somebody talk without the right internet or the technology to do it, and not the resources or the knowledge to be able to do it well, is broken or obsolete. So it's about finding the courageous leaders and making sure they're in schools and making sure that there's empowered teachers in each of those classrooms and making sure the students have the agency and the ability to go out and take risks. So my ask for you today in closing is to go to futurereadyschools.org and submit your email address and that is the badgeification element for this morning. On your way out, come up and grab a badge, and join us in this movement. And there's a lot of stuff that we don't know yet. There's a lot of questions that we haven't answered yet. And there's a lot of mistakes that we're going to make. But if we can times it by a thousand people going on this path with us and making these mistakes with us, I think we can come up with something super special. So in that, I want to say thank you so much for being the first people to have to listen to me talk about this stuff. It was a huge honor, and I look forward to seeing you guys later today. Thank you.